America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks for Peter. Welcome to our special, the World Economic Forum Explained. What is this thing? What is this annual gathering of globalists who want you to eat bugs? That's not all they want you to do, but that's a nice metaphor for the, for the kinds of things they want you to do. Right? It's a good metaphor for the kinds of unnatural, unhuman things that they want for you. They want to force very unnatural things upon you. The World Economic Forum run by this guy, Klaus Schwab. Check him out. What does it need to master the future? I think to have a platform where all stakeholders of global society are engaged. Like, are you, what is that? Like, that's just like central casting evil villain. That's like, what a, that's what a joke that is. We'll talk more about him. Like, if you were casting a movie for the evil villain and he tried out, you'd be like, nah, it's too on the nose. You can't. We'll talk more about him with our guests coming up in a little bit. Now, we did a special last year on how the World Economic Forum is trying to get you to eat more bugs. I just want to do the very short of that because it's a lot of other things there too. But again, it's a perfect metaphor. Um, they want you to eat bugs because they say that meat is bad for the planet. It takes up too much land, too much water. Cows emit too much methane gas, which contributes to global warming. Uh, they say that cows contribute more to global warming than cars, trains, ships, and planes combined. So they want to get rid of meat and they're gonna replace the protein with uh, bugs. This is why New York City schools uh, have meatless Mondays and they also have vegan Fridays. So two out of the five days of the week, there's no meat. This is all to indoctrinate young kids. Uh, de Blasio said, cutting back on meat uh, will improve New Yorkers' health and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, keeping our planet uh, green for generations to come. But they got to replace the meat with something, right? So they're going to replace it with the protein from bugs. Now, if people scoff at this, right? You may say, Slater, that's ridiculous. I'll never eat bugs. Yes, you will. You will. Now, first of all, your kids will. Grandkids will, because they won't know any different, because they'll slowly implement this. But you'll eat bugs. Do you know you already eat rapeseed? Do you know you eat rapeseed? If I told you the World Economic Forum is trying to get you to eat rapeseed, you'd be like, said, I'm not going to eat rapeseed. You already are. They just call it canola oil. Because who's going to eat rapeseed? <laughs> uh, now, this stuff's disgusting. Canola. This is, we got a little B-roll here. This is the production process of canola oil. So you eat that. They can get you to eat bugs. When's the last time you ever read the ingredients of something and it's full of a bunch of chemicals and you're like, oh, I'll never eat that. And you put it back and it's like, never. Like we eat a bunch of crap. So of course they can add bugs to the mix. Now they're not gonna say, hey, here's a bowl full of cockroaches, like in Fear Factor. They're not, that's not what they're gonna do. They're gonna grind it up. They grind it up, add a bunch of chemicals and colors and say, hey, here's your mealworm pizza sauce. Here's your mealworm bread. But they're not gonna call it mealworm. They'll call it like, a1 protein powder or something. Here's your A1 protein bread. And people are like, hmm, looks delicious. And they'll say, better for the planet. And then the government will subsidize it and uh, incentivize the globalist food companies to put this in their products. And because all the CEOs of our food production go to the World Economic Forum and they want to be good globalists and keep getting invited, they'll go along with this, uh, and with this worldview that says we know better and people should eat bugs. So here's how it works. These are, uh, here's a video of ground up mealworm. All this cake needs is flour, eggs, and 20 grams of dead insects. No, you haven't misheard. A team of scientists at Belgium's University of Ghent are trying to find a way to substitute dairy in cakes, cookies, and waffles. They say deriving grease from insects is more green than dairy production. By soaking the insects in a little bit of water and then mushing them with a kitchen blender before centrifuges separate a butter-like substance, a grease is made which the team used to bake with. But how does it go down outside of the lab? For me, there's no difference. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually better. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think you would eat insect fat cakes again? Yeah, yeah. Why, not? why not? The team say that consumers can't taste the difference when a quarter of the milk butter is replaced with the fat from the insects. But they start to notice when it gets to the halfway mark. So who knows? One day you could be munching on a cockroach croissant as you head to the office or making your nearest and dearest a beetle birthday cake. <laughs> cockroach croissant. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 
So you're saying, oh, this slide is ridiculous. I'll never do this. People don't want this. This is uh, this year's World Economic Forum. This is the head of Siemens talking about the need to eat bugs. My daughter, 24, inspired me and said that, how can you advocate for these zero carbon value chains if you still eat meat? And so I stopped eating meat. Now the math would say, well, you need to stop eating meat uh, 11 years to compensate for a flight to Thailand. Yes, but if a billion people stop eating meat, I tell you it has a big impact. I predict that we will have proteins not coming from um, meat in the future. They will probably taste even better, so why are we trying to mimic meat if we can have a better taste? They will be zero carbon and much healthier than the kind of food that we eat today. That is a mission that we need to get on. That's a mission. Right? It's just some uh, cockroach croissants. What's the problem? Just some uh, centrifuged grease-like substance from mealworms. I predict we will have proteins that don't come from meat in the future. Bill Gates said the developing world should still eat meat, but the first world doesn't need to be eating any more meat. Uh, I should say Siemens, by the way, they're a giant, massive company in Germany. Uh, they make like nuclear power plants and high-speed rail lines. There's like huge, big thing. So it's an influential company. This is the head of Unilever. Uh, maybe you've seen this infographic before. These are the 10 uh, biggest food companies. And you can see they own all food. I should put that in quotes. They own all the processed food that we eat. There's just like 10 companies and Unilever is kind of like the bottom middle there. So here's the head of Unilever. Our innovation is focused on products that you will eat every day, but that solves some of these problems. So four big areas, and I'll be pretty quick on those. Um, first of all, more plant-based eating, big focus for us. Um, because if we all ate a little bit less meat every day, it would go a long way in solving that emissions problem, and it's healthier for us too. So um, you get to products like Ben & Jerry's Dairy Free or Vegan Magnum, delicious. <laughs> don't have to change your habits, um, but they're vegan and they don't use cows. So that gets rounds of applause from their peers and then they push it upon you. And you think I'm crazy with this, but the European Union just approved two insects for food at the European Union. Crickets and mealworms and all these said, uh, or I predict they hinted and that they'll be the first major grocery store to be selling crickets in their food. Okay, so Now, that's not all they do at the World Economic Forum. Uh, we'll talk about ESG on today's show. We'll talk about China's influence. All right, let's learn our lesson from uh, COVID about China's influence in the United Nations and the World, uh, the World Health Organization. It's the same with the World Economic Forum. All these globalist institutions, China is the leading voice. China is imposing their worldview through these globalist organizations that have influence over you. We'll cover more on that in a little bit. Another problem with the World Economic Forum is it gives credibility to evil people. I'll give an example. Gustavo Petro, P-E-T-R-O, Petro. He was a leader of the M19 terrorist guerrilla group who in 1980s in Colombia, who in 1985 held their Supreme Court hostage when they raided the Palace of Justice. This was not January 6th. This was the real deal. They killed half of the 25 Supreme Court justices, 94 people died in total. Right? This group also stole 5,000 weapons from the Colombian military. And, and uh, it's, it's a terrible guerrilla group, right? The guy who was a part of that group, a Marxist guy, Gustavo Petro, he's now the president of Colombia. He's the president. And check this out. Here he is on stage at the World Economic Forum, sitting next to Al Gore. There's old Al from Tennessee wearing his cowboy boots. Former vice president, sitting next to the now Colum president of Columbia. And uh, isn't this all great? <laughs> and this is uh, the moment when uh, Petro blamed capitalism for causing climate change. Here it is. We have to put an end to this if we wish to live in our planet. Can our capitalism do this? Based on the current data, we won't be able to do so. Therefore, 
perhaps we should do the following reflection. If capitalism is unable to do so, either humanity will die with it or humanity will overcome capitalism so that we can live in our planet. And the solution for these people is Marxism, just in the name of environmentalism now. In the name of environmentalism, capitalism isn't working, so we need to bring in a new system. And that, the system is the old system that is Marxism. That's all it is. And the people at the World Economic Forum say, hmm, yes, yes, ooh, very interesting. Yeah, Because it's this beautiful big stage. Right? Oh, yeah, wow, great. And now this monster, this Marxist guy, has a way to spread his Marxist ideology to the most influential people uh, in our systems. Uh, another element to this, some Americans go, and that adds to the credibility of all this as well, but there's an argument that they should go. So like the governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, went to the World Economic Forum, and you're like, ah, there's a debate, like is that a good idea or not? Would you go? Like you're, if you're a conservative, would you go to the World Economic Forum and speak? Would you go to counter the Marxist worldview? Trump went, Trump went in 2018. So would you go to be the voice against all of this? Or does you being there give authority to these people and their terrible ideas as well? You like sanction it by your presence. That's interesting. I could see both arguments on that. We'll talk to our guest about that coming up in a little bit as well. So why do we have to pay attention to this? Why does this matter? Why do we pay attention to this gathering of globalists? Stephen Miller actually put this very well. He said, one of the many reasons we must focus more on Davos, World Economic Forum, is because our political and financial elite hunger for validation from the global elite. Just as yesterday's Marxist academic theory becomes today's dogma, so too does a Davos panel today become tomorrow's regulatory framework. It's a great point. You look at all the nonsense that came from our universities about transgender children, for instance, and now it's everywhere in every public school across the country. Like that's how that spreads. And it's true for uh, our nation. Through, goes through, these terrible ideas go through the World Economic Forum and then spread out to all of our systems across the country. So spreading, spending time at the World Economic Forum is a look in the crystal ball of what's coming next for us here in America. From the globalists to here in this country, the people who run our companies and media and Hollywood. What are they going to be pushing next? You want to know? Well, just look at what they're talking about today. And we can see how effective they've been in just the last few decades at changing our culture in profound ways. So the only way to stop their next round of changes is to know what they're pushing and get in front of it. Amazing guest. Talk more about all, all about all of this. Coming up next, Mike Slater, World Economic Forum Explained. Spread the word. <laughs> Um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, so that we penetrate the cabinets. Mm, penet penetrate the cabinets. Interesting. That guy, Klaus Schwab. We'll talk about him. Let's go right to Connor Tomlinson. He is from lotuseaters.com to give us the great overview, the overview we need to understand what the World Economic Forum is all about, what they're up to. Connor, how are you, sir? Very happy to join you today, Mike. Thank you very much. I'm grateful you're here. What do we need to know? You're, you're talking to someone who doesn't really follow this stuff. They don't know what's going on. And, and they're like, hey, I've heard about the World Economic Forum. W quickly, what do, what do you tell someone before they totally lose interest and call you a crazy conspiracy theorist? Well, the World Economic Forum are an unelected think tank that market themselves as a neutral nexus where a bunch of world leaders, business people can come and meet and discuss policies on how to make the world a better place. At least that's, that's right. what they'd like us to believe. And unfortunately, they have dark designs for us, such as confiscating all of your property by 2030 and believing that the complete collapse of energy security via the removal of fossil fuels overnight for countries that are currently developing, like Malawi, for example, who still need to burn wood and can't just get straight onto renewables overnight, um, they're going to take that away too. So it's not the best idea to be subscribed to them when they don't particularly provide us any value. Uh, they, We don't have any say over the policies that they discuss, yet they hand them on high like received wisdom to our world leaders who increasingly have become part of their world leaders summer camp called the young global leaders network what how is this different than 
uh, you just saying, I disagree with these ideas. And that's fair, I, I don't happen to agree with them, but is it worse than these are just bad ideas? Well, it's fine to have bad ideas, it's just living under them is a total other question. It seems that <laughs> I suppose it's just a coincidence and a conspiracy theory that the UN and the World Economic Forum's date for pretty much every policy and prediction, like you will no longer eat meat, like the US will no longer be the leader on the global stage and said we will have a multipolar world led by the likes of China and the BRICS alliance. All of those have a date of 2030. And it just so happens that the decarbonization agenda in Britain, for example, has a date of 2030. But plenty of other countries have signed up to 2030 to scrap things like boilers and cars it's a very strange thing to have it all hinge in one place. And so it leads us, just by process of elimination, to think maybe they got all these ideas from somewhere. And then the World Economic Forum are producing articles, papers, conferences, and promotional videos which say, yeah, they, they all come from us. I, I think when people tell you who they are, we should believe them. And, and what they're telling us yeah. is we have some very bad ideas for you. Yeah, it's very odd. That, the thing you referenced earlier about by 2030, you will own nothing and you'll like it. They've since scrubbed it from their website, but the Twitter account, the Twitter page of it's still there. Like they wrote an article about it. Like they're not hiding any of this stuff. I find that a bit odd. Can you give me an example to the person who's saying that uh, we're overreaching, Connor? Can you give me an example of their, their influence so far? We have to wait till 2030. What have they done so far that is not good? Well, actually, the, the perfect influence is the fact that um, in the UK, we're basically a testing ground for the World Economic Forum's ideas. I know that the Biden administration recently put out a uh, blueprint for digital and AI human rights. So in the UK, our version of that is currently being spearheaded. The policy is being written on the UK government website by the World Economic Forum. Our former health secretary, Matt Hancock, in 2017, introduced Klaus Schwab to a... Um, uh, parliamentary Committee for the Fourth Industrial Revolution directly to his colleagues. So they, they have intimate ties here. And then they have a document on their website from 2015 called Blueprint for a Digital Identity. Now, pretty much every NGO, every bank, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Reuters and the like, and the UK Cabinet Office at the time elected to be Conservatives, in name only over here, of course, and the Australian government coordinated on this. Now in the UK, being currently rolled out, is a digital ID citizens consultation because the government planned to implement it by 2023 along with digital currencies which our prime minister rishi sunak has already spoken about you can see the wef roadmap over the last decade has been laid out on their website absolutely transparently and now the governments are implementing the policies but for some reason you're called a conspiracy theorist when you notice the connection yeah what do what motivates carl schwab at the top and then what motivates the elites around the world. And we played a clip from uh, one of the board members of Siemens. We played a clip from the head of Unilever earlier. I mean, we go on, it's, all, it's the, the, the who's who, right? What motivates them to even want to be a part of this group? What, what's, the, what's the benefit for them? I think if we tackle the CEOs and the politicians first, that'll understand why people get co-opted into it. This is the framework called ESGs. Obviously, Ron DeSantis has been taking the fight to that, but over here, no politician has noticed. ESGs, environmental social governance scores, are like an insurance mechanism against get woke, go broke. It allows them to lead an insurrection against the board members like they did at ExxonMobil and supplant them with people who are ideologically compliant. And if the company yeah. has a high social credit score by doing woke activism or climate activism, then they get a lot of funding, sub Cities from the hedge funds and the capital investment firms partnered with the World Economic Forum, like BlackRock. So if you're a CEO and you subscribe to ESGs, and you know eventually governments are going to adopt it down the line with, as I said, with the blueprint for digital identity, a digital currency and a digital citizen's ID wallet with a corporate identity angle, then you know you're going to be the only game in town. You know that you're going to yes. have some very lucrative backers that are going to make you a corporate monopoly in line with governments. Like they say, public-private partnership. What motivates Klaus Schwab, I think, is actually a bit more philosophical. Um, I think Jean-Jacques Rousseau probably wrote this best way back before pre-revolutionary France. What he, what he wants to create, seemingly, is a totalitarian state which affords all citizens the total freedom to endlessly consume and be pleasured by renewable-powered metaverse machines that directly stimulate your dopamine uh, receptors in your brain by a brain chip, but without any of those pesky relationships to get in the way, without any those pesky, pesky responsibilities. It's basically fully automated luxury communism, and it's a total madcap pipe dream, but it's only for him and his friends. Whoever survives the Great Reset will go on to do it, but I'm worried that some of us won't. Okay, Jesus, it's done there. Beautiful. Rousseau wrote about that? 
Yes, he wrote something called the. It's in the social contract. He said it is going to be the state of nature in a civilization. He said it's going to be the general will state. So the general will state acts on behalf of the citizens because, of course, the state knows exactly what the citizens want. It's like Lenin's vanguardism, right? But the state yes. of nature is before we were all cruelly taken out of nature and plucked into a civilization because, of course, nature provides and isn't cruel at all. And he thought we were all just wandering around, having no relationships. We'd have kids and then just abandon them. That seems to be the idea that they want to get back to, where you're completely disconnected from anyone else. You have no obligations, no nothing tying you down, nothing oppressing you. But you can just sit there and have a brain chip and look at all sorts of sordid things on the internet all the time that make you feel good. Basically, like the people in chairs in Wally. Yeah, that's right. Well, Rousseau abandoned his five children at the orphanage, had them killed, so he didn't want those relationships either. I could see why he would want Marx to impose that same on others. Marx wasn't the best dad either, was he? It seems to be a track no, record no. here. Yeah, these are horrific monsters of people. Um, okay, let's go back to the ESG. I want to I wanna make sure I can explain this uh, well. So you're saying these big, giant corporations, the CEOs, they see where the economy is going, they see where the power is going to be, and that is this ESG framework, which is just like woke framework. We're gonna be environmentally, socially uh, woke in every way. And we're gonna get these bonus points. We're gonna get scored. And if we play the game the best, then we're gonna get the most money from governments and we're gonna get the most money from uh, hedge funds like BlackRock or whatever. They're gonna give us the money. So if we can get in front of this, then we'll be, as you said, the only game in town. So you think that's their financial incentive for being a part of it. And maybe, maybe they even believe a lot of this garbage as well. But you're saying that's what's pushing this. Is that a good repeating of what you said? Absolutely. And again, we come back to, okay, how is this being rolled out in a test country? Well, there are two examples here. Number one, the Conservatives are going to get absolutely demolished this <coughs> election in the UK, right? And so hmm. Keir Starmer, who went to Davos and said he prefers Davos to Westminster, is basically the Prime Minister in waiting. One of his MPs, who, by the way, pretended way back when that she got a personal letter from Obama when she didn't, so you can see what kind of integrity these people have that are going to govern our lives. Hmm. She said that we need a career escalator rather than a career ladder, specifically for black women, LGBT, disabled wow. people, the like. So you're picking groups, grievance-mongered groups, to play favorites with, and that is what gets you the incentives if you have those many people suddenly appointed to your board with the ESG um, implementing hedge funds. They're going to give you money for that. So this looks like a government policy that looks very similar to what the WEF are proposing. So there's also at the local government level, and this is one way that Americans and Brits can fight back, they're rolling out the 15-minute cities idea. So it's happening in Canterbury, where I used to go to university, Oxford and Bath at the moment. And the funny thing is, the other day, when members of Oxford were rolling these barriers out of their streets, and lots of articles came out online saying they're going to lock you in districts and fine you for moving between areas of the city, the Oxford City Council came out and like every good little drone of the government, parrot the same line saying it's a conspiracy theory, it's misinformation, don't worry, we're not putting steel barriers up, it's just some cameras to make sure climate emissions get down. These people are fundamentally incapable of independent thought, but they really would like a secure job, so they say whatever the masters say they are, like Squealer and Animal Farm. Yes, 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 okay, so that's important, because big picture, globally, is there any competing voice and vision to this is there? I mean, we're not it. America's not. Who's what? For, what's like the global conservative voice to speak against it? And and what country is out there saying, hey, this is a really bad idea? Slash, what are we, the American people, going to do, and the British people, going to do to stop this when our leaders are so dead set on imposing it upon us? I think we need to be, and it's slightly concerning to me um, when you say that America is currently not it. I understand the Biden administration most definitely aren't it, mainly because President Biden can't string a coherent sentence together. But you do have the occasional conservative politician that feels uh, fills us Brits across the pond with a little bit of hope. I, I think one of the things actually the WEF is most afraid of, and if you read their risk report, they, they equate misinformation and disinformation, which is us saying things on the internet they don't like, with nuclear war as a threat of destabilizing the state. So if we continue to speak up and raise these issues into public consciousness, I mean, 
last year when I was first on the first, right? Your wonderful network did the due diligence of talking about this issue. But when I spoke about it on another network in the UK, a radio network, even though the clip did very well, I was deplatformed off of other shows because other hosts said I was spreading conspiracy theories. Now it's gotten mm. to the point where we, our disparate networks, have talked about it so much, it's in the public consciousness. People are talking about it at the bar, at the pub, at the gym, all these sorts of things. So because it is in people's minds, the WEF are very afraid. And the other thing the WEF are afraid of, even though they really like China, is BRICS. So currently, the US, the UK, and the like have screwed ourselves over economically by sanctioning Russia. No matter how you feel about the Ukraine and Russia conflict, the sanctions have not been a good thing for us. So what's happened is it's pushed Russia into the arms of China. They've got all the gold, they've got all the oil and natural gas, and China have lots of the rare earth minerals that these countries need to decarbonize lithium, cobalt, all the types of stuff. So what's happening is in the West report, they're proposing buying debt from countries that are in debt to the Chinese Belt and Road in order to get them on their side. So the WEF are currently afraid of the bifurcation of the economy away from globalism into localism. So if at the local level we can organize, we can bring some politicians up through the rank and we can continue speaking about these issues online, that will really have them quaking in their boots. Tremendous. Uh, give me the 30 second on what lotuseaters.com is all about. Uh, LotusEaters.com was started by Sargon of Akkad, a.k.a. Carl Benjamin, my wonderful boss, named after the passage in the Odyssey where Odysseus's men go to the Isle of the Lotus Eaters, where they sit and eat the flower of the lotus. And it's the only place where if the men get off the boat, um, they don't all die on Odysseus's <laughs> futile trip back home. So we thought, hey, we'll have a contemplative place where we can sit and figure things out while the rest of the country goes rapidly off into the direction we don't want to. And, and hopefully some of our fellow countrymen realize this is not a journey that's worth embarking on. We should go back to the Isle of Lotus Eaters. <laughs> well done. Everyone go make it a part of your daily routine. LotusEaters.com. Connor Tomlinson, uh, a pleasure, sir. I hope we can do it again. Thank you very much. Cheers. Coming up next, uh, the wonderful James Lindsay uh, will go and talk about the psychology, like what motivates these people to be a part of this? What is the, the worldview ideological pull? And Connor just mentioned public-private partnership. There's a word for that. It's fascism. We'll define that next. Spread the word. And the accumulated amount is now trapping as much extra heat as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every single day on the Earth. That's what's boiling the oceans, creating these atmospheric rivers and the rain bombs and sucking the moisture out of the land and creating the droughts and melting the ice and raising the sea level and causing these waves of climate refugees predicted to reach one billion in this century. Look at the xenophobia and political authoritarian trends that have come from just a few million refugees. What about a billion? We would lose our capacity for self-governance on this world. We have to act. Oh, that's so good. That's such a wonderful clip. I want to go right to James Lindsay. Our last segment did a great job overviewing the World Economic Forum. And, and now we'll go a little bit deeper with our friend James Lindsay. He's got a new book out, The Marxification of Education. Follow him on Twitter, Conceptual James. And then uh, his big website is newdiscourses.com. Engage in all those different places. James, great to talk to you again, brother. Hey, yeah. Wasn't that great with Al Gore? I mean, I didn't know that the sea level was rising or the oceans are boiling, but that sounds extraordinarily scary, and I'm glad he's brought attention to that issue. <laughs> I live in San Diego. I would have known. I was there the other day. They're definitely not boiling at all. Uh, but this is such a perfect segue, because what do we need to know about these people? What do we need to know about the psychology or the personalities or the, or the worldview of these people? Why do they love this stuff so much? Uh, power. Um, honestly, you know, having read an obscene amount of their literature, watched an obscene number of times where they sit on a stage like that, either very smugly yeah. and calm and collected like they're going to rule the world, or very mad like Al Gore because it looks like maybe they're not going to now because nobody trusts them and they're getting very uh, scared and frustrated. I, I think that there's this kind of psychological profile of people who want power and control, but they also want to be seen kind of as a messiah figure. They're the ones who are going to save us from ourselves because they're the the ultimate good expert leader type person who's going to, going to walk us, walk humanity out of its own stupid foibles. Look how dumb we all are. We're just doing things like driving our cars and causing the oil, the oceans to boil and, and whatever else. 
And they know so much better than us and they're gonna save us from ourselves. And it just so happens that they also get to be in charge to make sure to do so. Yeah, that's definitely it. Let me have one quick question on that. And I always sidebar with you, but uh, help me understand this. So Rousseau believed that people were born good. Is that a true statement, first of all? Yes. Okay, so if he believed people were born good, and a lot of these progressives have, a, have that worldview, how does that reconcile with the fact that people are stupid idiots who drive cars and boil the oceans, oh, right? If really people simple. are good, when, yeah. Well, most people aren't aware, right? They have good impulses, but they aren't aware. They don't have what the Greeks would have called nose or mind. They don't have a kind of glimpse of the divine mind. They haven't reached a higher level of consciousness. They operate under false consciousness. So uh, while they tend to be good, they misuse their goodness by directing it toward things that are evil. Whereas on the other hand, when you become enlightened, you can use things that seem tyrannical or bad and direct them toward things that are good. This is what Hegel called the cunning of reason sort of, is that people do bad things through their intellect, but it comes out good because uh, history is to progress toward a particular end. And of course, Hegel der derived many of his ideas from Rousseau. And so it's a, I mean, this sounds really weird and abstruse and we don't have to get too sidebar-y, but this is ultimately a disposition that we used to call Gnosticism. It is that mm -hmm. there are certain people who are the enlightened elect. Those people understand the world better than everybody else. And therefore, they have awakened their minds, whereas everyone else is stuck in a false consciousness. So they have to rule and lead us. And we just saw Al Gore describe things that are not happening as though they're happening as justification for why he should be that person. Yeah, so good. Perfect. I knew you'd have an answer to bridge that. I, I had that disconnect, but I knew there was some way that they went from Rousseau to uh, the stage of the World Economic Forum. So your book is about the Marxification of education. Marxism mm -hmm. has become a very scary word, uh, and it means a lot of things now to a lot of people or whatever. Are these people Marxists, something different? How do you describe their worldview? Yes. <laughs> so what's <laughs> happened, and a lot of people don't understand this, and honestly, if I might toot my own horn for half a second, I think it's my most valuable contribution to the con conversation so far. What's happened is that through the 1960s, but also, I mean, even older through the Fabians and the, you know, the Fabian socialism, all this, there was this realization that the Marxists weren't getting anywhere until they tied themselves to big money. And then when we have the, the era of the 1960s, the neo-Marxist turn, you have them writers writing down, there's something wrong here. Capitalism is working. It makes people have a good life. What are we going to do? It's made the working class complacent and conservative and, and content. That's not good. And so what they realized was not just that they have to do this march through the institutions, but in fact, if you read, say, One Dimensional Man by Herbert Marcuse from the 1960s, the second chapter is extremely clear on this. We need to see capitalism, capitalism and socialism as kind of dialectical pairs that can be mixed together into a new kind of program that's going to do, uh, you know, all the things we need it to do. It's going to produce like capitalism, but it's going to redistribute like socialism. Mm. And they pioneered that model in China. The man that followed Mao Zedong named Deng Xiaoping pioneered the model. His famous line was, I don't care if the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. So he doesn't care if the economy has a market or if it's command as long as it works, as long as it makes the, the regime and the party stay in power. And we just heard Klaus Schwab say the same thing at the World Economic Forum interview that he did, where he said that there's state capitalism, and then there has all these ad advantages. And then there is, uh, on the other hand, shareholder capitalism, which has certain advantages, but also has problems. But he proposes a different model called a stakeholder capitalism. And stakeholder capitalism is now you have this council of experts, Russian word for council is Soviet, we'll just point that out. Council of experts who are gonna decide for us how business is gonna be done, how the governments are gonna make a decision through what they call a public-private partnership, AKA fascism. And so what you see is that the corporate sector, which is shareholder capitalism, and the command Marxist sector, which is state capitalism, have fused into a new program called stakeholder capitalism, which is in fact their combination. And that, that's why people can't see this as Marxism because it's using corporations to achieve what governments in the West can't do because of things like the Bill of Rights. Yeah, bummer. Um, this, sorry, this reminds me of Karl Marx himself though. Karl Marx was this massive freeloader on his family and he was just like, couldn't wait for family members to die so he could get some inheritance. And all of his money came from Engels whose dad owned a company that he took over and 
gave all the money to Marx to continue on with his Marxist thing. So like that, like Karl Marx himself was a fusion of his uh, of capitalism and uh, and well Marxism. Uh, fascinating. Um, I mean, communism has okay. always been a rich man's game, right? Always been a yeah. rich man's game. Of course. Uh, I want to play this clip here as we get into ESG. This is Larry Fink. He's the CEO of BlackRock. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's like maybe like the leading capitalist pusher of all this stuff. And he says, you're overreacting, James. Here's Larry Fink. How much has the political backlash, thank you, to ESG investing had on you and BlackRock? I'm taking this very seriously. Uh, we are trying to address the misconceptions. Uh, it is, uh, it's hard uh, because it's not, it's not business anymore. They're doing it in a personal way. And in the first time in my professional career, um, attacks are now personal. Um, they're trying to demonize issues. Now, you misunderstand, James. What do you say to him? I mean, I just see a guy who punched his wife in the face and she retaliated and scratched his arm and he holds up the scratch and says, look what you just did. That's personal, you know? And so it's like, come on, this guy is managing $10 trillion or thereabouts of other people's assets. He's making deals with China. He hides his stuff in China. That's shady, uh, which by the way, is the model, which is what Klaus Schwab just told us. And we already know that it's a communist fascist tyranny. Um, this guy is managing $10 trillion or thereabouts of other people's assets to do his social activism with other people's money. Like, the attacks are personal. Um, dude, you're in the arena. Like, belly up. Yeah, like you've never been attacked yourself, James. No, um, no, no, never, never. No, no, no. Let me, uh, so our last guest, I think did a pretty good job uh, describing ESG. And let me put it through my brain and see if I can articulate this well, because everyone needs to be able to articulate. So you have ESG, so the reason companies are jumping on with this, whether maybe they believe it, like Larry Fink, or it's just for economic reason, they see where the world economy is going, and everyone's gonna get this social credit score based on environmental and social justice, and, stuff. and the higher their score, the more uh, money they get from the governments, and the more money they get from places like BlackRock, and their company grows, and if they can get there first, they'll be the only game in town. Is that okay? What am I missing from that explainer? Well, you're missing the cartel aspect. That's a decent explanation. You know, the E is environmental, so you behave the way that Larry Fink thinks we should behave in the environment. The S is social, so you do all the social justice stuff, or if it flips over to some other social program, you're gonna have to deal with that too. Uh, and governance means you appoint the people that Larry Fink wants you to have on, his, on your board. When I said that he controls this many assets, though, you have to understand, it's something like between BlackRock, State Street, and um, Vanguard Group, the top three of these big investment banks that are all incestuous with each other. They run some, they, they, they control the assets that represent something like 40% of the S&P 500. So they own wow. giant portions of the shares of large corporations like Coca-Cola and Disney and so on that we see acting badly and not reforming when people get mad at mm -hmm. them and boycott their products or whatever. And the reason is, because they know that somebody like Larry Fink could pull the plug, sell a gigantic chunk of their assets, maybe 30% a day, watch their stock prices tank, delist them from these ESG um, kind of mutual fund index fund kind of programs. And all of a sudden they become a toxic asset on the market. And so even a corporation as large as Coca-Cola or Disney is at the mercy of um, Larry Fink the gun by being able to pull out all of their assets or control their assets. And again, if you wanna have a good score, you're gonna to appoint to your corporate board, at least four members that somebody in the cartel likes, and you're gonna follow the policies, the ENS policies that the, that the cartel likes. And this is just how it works. So what you're missing here is that this is a cartel operation. This is racketeering being done on corporations to put them into a social credit system that they can't get out of. They, they don't have any options. Yeah. So we're getting mad at corporations where what we should be doing is going to the corporations and saying, you know what, we need to team up and try to free you from the cartel. We need to we need mm. to get what we can of the government that's not totally lost to start doing investigations, hearings, and digging in to get you out of this trap. Yeah, that's right. Because who are they gonna listen to now? Me, Disney, they're gonna listen to me for not buying a ticket? Or are they gonna listen to Larry Fink who owns you know, most of the company? Uh, last question for you, James. What, um, people are gonna say this is uh, conspiratorial, this is Bilderberg Group, whatever. Can you point to something that they've already been effective at and be like, hey, listen, people, like they're already moving. So yeah, their goals by 2030 are very achievable if they keep going. Has anybody seen Canada recently? How's New Zealand doing? I mean, come on. 
what have they been effective at? They brag that it's their guy that's working in Canada or their, you know, their person who's in charge of New Zealand. And you can see entire, we're not talking about like, oh, wow, they've moved Disney's policies around. We're talking about they've, enti- they've moved entire countries uh, into, mm-hmm. I, I saw the New York Post a couple of months ago said that Canada, I mean, it's a New York Post opinion. It's not some authoritative thing, but they reported that in their opinion that Canada is no longer a liberal democracy, but is an authoritarian state. And that's all mm-hmm. under the direction of these um these kind of moves, but we see it again with Disney. Disney takes takes it on the chin to the tune of uh, what ten figures, eleven figures, something like that, and it's just like, yeah, we're still going to groom your kids with our entertainment programming yeah. because they don't care. So you can see the amount that they're that they're able to affect. They're t- they're part paired up. No one knows the ESG came from. It didn't come from the World Economic Forum. It didn't come from Larry Fink. It came from James Gifford at the United Nations. They're all paired up with the United Nations. They say they're paired up. They have a formal agreement with the United Nations, and the United Nations is putting in programs to transform education across the world through UNESCO, for example. The NEA has already taken those up in the United States. So what? why do we have this weird sexuality education in American schools, all of them, paired with Planned Parenthood? Because that's the United Nations idea. And UNESCO said, why are we moving toward sustainable development goal, Agenda 2030, education, which we are. The NEA has said so. It's coming out in the educational professional stuff because UNESCO published the documents since 2019 saying that's the direction that we need to go. And it's tied up. You can't throw a rock and not hit a success story for their agenda at this point. Yeah. And who's pushing back? Uh, You are. James Lindsay, the Marxification of education. Newdiscourses.com is the website. Conceptual James on Twitter. Keep up the wonderful work, sir. Thanks. World Economic Forum explained. More next. Spread the word. The sophistication of the private sector is is improving and and particularly important the level of collaboration between the private sector and the government, especially the FBI has I think uh, made significant strides. Okay, so our last guest, James Lindsay, made the obvious point. Public-private partnership? Public-private, that's just fascism. It's just a fancy way of saying fascism. And when you have that guy, Chris Ray, who's the head of the FBI, talking about, hey, we got great uh, cooperation with the FBI, that should be a concern, you'd think. Jordan Schachtel is here. He's the publisher of The Dossier on Substack. Make sure you subscribe to that. Jordan, how are you, brother? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Let me just give you a chance to react to that. What is Chris Ray talking about exactly? Give me maybe maybe best case scenario, and then uh, we could put our conspiratorial hat on, which more often than not turns out to be the true thing. Best case scenario is that he just wants people to chip in and help the FBI investigate crimes in an ethical manner. Um, I'm not even (laughs) sure why. That was torture. Domestic law enforcement agency is in Davos because the FBI's purview does not is not supposed to leave the United States, but that's a whole separate issue. I think worst case scenario is that he's talking about this, uh, what, what James Lindsay described as fascism, where any type of uh, you know anti-freedom, pro-surveillance movement, the FBI is certainly a big part of that. That they just don't they don't believe in the principle of free speech. I mean, I, I lived in D.C. for a pretty long time and got to know a lot of these Department of Justice officials. And the idea of people sp- speaking freely amongst themselves without being monitored by the government, they view that as extremism. You know, the idea that we have our fundamental liberties, uh, that they should remain in check through, you know, encrypted apps or, you know, through parallel systems. They, they think that as, you know, basically we're all a bunch of drug dealers and terrorists if we don't want to be monitored by the government. Do, they, do you think they think that because they're in this world, this secret, important, clandestine world, and what they know is very, very important, and and you people don't understand. And like, or like, wh- where do you think that comes from? This idea that freedom of speech isn't a thing people should have. Yeah, it's not only the sense that I get from the the Washington elites, but certainly from the Davos ruling class. I mean, in fact, uh, Klaus Schwab has authored um, several books over the past few years, and this is a major sticking point of his. In fact, he always seems to have you know, major dislike for the resistance, which he 
informs the reader <laughs> is largely based in the United States. You know, there's tens of millions of people in this country who who stick, who are stubbornly uh, affixed to the constitutional rights that they possess. And, and I think that, you know, a character like Christopher Ray perfectly fits in because he's just a member of this uniparty blob that feels that they have the right to run roughshod over our freedom. So that's why they now have intelligence officials who share this worldview leading the delegation to Davos. Mm. I mean, Davos is supposed to be an organization about, supposedly about economic cooperation, and yet you have the, the, the director of national intelligence and Chris Ray and these other figures involved in this like no, multinational surveillance supposed law enforcement schemes uh, leading the del I, I think it speaks volumes that a person like yeah, that is at Davos. Who, and I shouldn't even be asking this because I, I don't know enough to even ask the question properly, but wasn't there some woman who said something like, we need to reconfigure freedom of speech rights or something like that? Does that ring a bell? It, 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 it's, it's, it's almost every, every panelist. Uh, you know, the, the lady that was speaking to Brian Stelter, I don't know what her name was, and then and Stelter was kind of just like nodding in, in approval because when you go to Davos, it's not actually a place to debate. It's a place to, to network in person in, in this closed door setting uh, amongst the ruling elite. And of course, they only invite the corporate press who are all partners to Davos. So, so there's, there's no room for debate. It, it's all just conformity. And even people who claim to support speech, like a guy like, you know, fired CNN anchor Brian Stelter, when this lady's talking to him, attacking the First Amendment, he's just like, yeah, you know, makes sense. Like, he actually can't <laughs> debate And I actually wrote about this in, in my Substack that it's just, like, Davos is just a clown show where the, the, the ruling class just uh, disagrees amongst themselves about what they want to impose upon civilization. And in fact, mm -hmm. um, the, the World Economic Forum people stress this repeatedly, that there's, there's no dissent from the climate narrative, this, the, the, the fascist narrative, nothing. Dissent means you're removed from the club, but nobody wants to be removed from the club. Yeah, that's right, great point. Uh, we got about one minute. Tell me what you know about digital IDs. Our first guest mentioned it briefly here, but what's the vision, the ultimate vision, and how can they implement digital IDs around the world? Yes, so whether it's digital ID or central bank digital currency, this is basically the ruling um, class, the global ruling class gaslighting people into, they want to make you believe that technology is going to free you from those everyday hassles like preserving your privacy. So I think, you know, digital ID, you can see that through what China did with their COVID vaccine passports, where basically like you scan this QR code through this flying drone in the sky. And if the flying drone says like, you're not approved to pass through, then you're basically stuck in your zone. Digital ID is meant to surveil and, and impose privacy restrictions um, on the entire population. It, 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 it's just, you know, whether it's digital ID, the metaverse, central bank digital currencies, they're just always thinking of ways to craft like a bumper sticker marketing slogan for surveillance and the vacuuming up of power in, in their hands. Yep, because they know better than you. That's been the theme of, the, of you and all of our guests today. Jordan Schachtel, uh, subscribe to the dossier on Substack. Jordan, thanks for your time, brother. Thanks for having me. We talk on this show and my radio show a lot about worldviews and how important it is to know not only what they think, because we did a lot of that today. We talked about Rousseau and Marx and like, what are the, what is Hegel? Like, what, what are these worldviews from these people who think they're better than you? We also need to know what our worldview is. I believe our worldview can beat, can win against this other worldview, but not if we don't know what it is. So we need to be able to clearly define what is, you can call it the American worldview or the conservative worldview, so that we can articulate it and, and, and hold it up and celebrate the alternative celebrate what I believe is better and what is the truth. The only way to beat this other worldview, this World Economic Forum worldview, is to know and lift up our worldview. And that's what we will continue to explore and articulate together. Mike Slater, World Economic Forum Explained. Please go spread the word.